Right in. So yeah, um, today, uh, if you're viewing this video, you might be viewing it from a couple different angles. One, you might be on my YouTube channel watching a video that will eventually be a, a chat and interview about game design, game publishing, game production. But you see someone on the screen today that you're not used to seeing. Uh, this is, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself in a second, but this is an interview that that uh, this person, Michael here, has instigated or initiated with me, and we're having a little chat today about, about game production. So why don't you let people know who you are? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, so um, I, I'm, I guess I'm sort of instigating as well, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Michael Fetters. Uh, I'm a, a game design student uh, studying for my master's, and this is for an arts entrepreneurship uh course i'm taking to learn kind of about the business aspects of game design game production that kind of fun stuff so we're gonna most of our questions will be kind of more focused in that area but yeah yeah so michael is one of a handful of people who over the years have reached out to me and said you know can, can i meet up with you for a cup of coffee or whatnot and i pretty much stopped doing cups of coffee during the pandemic and i found that i really like to have these chats in some form, form of public forum so that other people can can listen to them or read from them or, or you know benefit from them in some way. And so Michael, I think was maybe you might be the first person ever to respond to that email and be like, okay, I'll I'll do that. Everyone else who I've ever said that to has, has said, uh, no thanks, I, I, I don't want to do that. So I appreciate your bravery to, to jump on here and have this little conversation. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's kind of surprising people haven't taken you up on that. Seems like it would be great for everybody if they'd be able to hear this kind of stuff. So that would be my hope. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So what do you what do you want to chat about today? What's on your mind? So so yeah, um, I have to have a few questions I've kind of come up with that, that seemed like they'd be helpful to a, a, a new game designer, somebody who's wanting to maybe start their own company, which kind of things I'm looking at. I'm looking at board game design, video game design. So um, just some, some of the things that I'm kind of looking at in this course. Um, so okay, that's the first question I have is kind of uh, what factors kind of influenced you as you kind of expanded your company? Like I, you started as a small company and it kind of grown, like what, what, decide you, okay, well, we need to add this person or we need to add this part of our production. You know, how did you, how did you decide when to, was good to expand your company to not over, overextend yourself? Yeah, that's good. I, I love the way you ended that question because that was kind of where it was getting to the point where I realized I was overextending myself. Um, I, the company has uh, changed in a few ways over the years. So we, we recently celebrated our 10th anniversary and for eight of those 10 years, it was just me as the sole full-time employee at Stamar Games. And for the first year and a half, I was uh, like even earlier than that, I was doing it part time along with another job. So kind of the first step was me going full time for the company. Um, and then the next step, uh, six and a half years later, was me realizing that I was limiting the growth of the company by just trying to do it myself. That that uh, and, and specifically there were and so we still do this. We use a lot of independent contractors. And I realized that there are a lot of these little things that I was outsourcing to various very talented people that would probably be best if consolidated in someone who was just a full, another full-time salary person at Stomar Games. And so that became Joe's position. Joe is our director of communications. And then later that year, not planned at all, but um, it just kind of worked out where we have worked with a distribution broker and a warehouse here in St. Louis called Greater Than Games, another company that you, you're probably familiar with. Um, great company, and they have a giant warehouse. They've kind of invested in a lot of infrastructure, whereas Stomar Games has been a, a work-from-home style of company where we don't have a lot of overhead. But we've worked with them for a long time, and I realized that it would probably be best at that point in, in my company's life cycle to uh, bring distribution brokerage in-house. And uh, for those watching who don't know what distribution brokerage is, I, I know I'm answering a lot here, Michael. We'll, we'll talk back and forth about this in a second. Um, but distribution brokerage is we sell our games partially to distributors who then sell those games to retailers who then sell games to individual people. Um, some of those retailers are online, some of them are brick and mortar stores. And uh, distribution brokerage is when is essentially a salesperson who lets distributors know when we have available inventory for them to buy. And whenever distributors have an order, that person handles the incoming order um, and make sure that the warehouse actually sends it out. So we eventually we decided at that point that it would be best to bring that position in-house. That's a long answer there. Let me know, let me hear your thoughts no, on that or any, any follow-up questions. No, no, about that's that great. I mean, that actually yeah. touches on some of the other questions. Another one of the questions I had about distributors menu. Um, I, I guess related question was like um like production man, uh, manufacturing. Like, how did you do? How does that connect into your distribution brokers? You know, how do you decide on who who's going to produce? What you know, what what producers are creating the actual product itself? Have you had to ever had to actually change mid course through a, a manufacturer because of issues with that manufacturer 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Production is, you know, is a whole whole beast of its own. And um, sometimes when I mention to people that I'm a, a, a game publisher, uh, they somewhat they maybe assume if they don't know anything about the industry, they might assume that I am that I'm like physically making the games. And in some industries, that might still be the case. But for us, we work with a, uh, a production company that's based in Canada, and they have their main facility in China um, called Panda. I worked with Panda for pretty much the entire time that I've worked at Stonemaier Games, all, all 10 years. And there was an exception there. There was one break. I, and your question is, did I ever like stop in the middle of a print run and be like, no, this just isn't working out. I need to find another production company. I haven't done that, but Panda has done that. So Panda has a factory in China, but they also work with a lot of smaller factories in China that focus on making like a very specific component. Like uh, I have Rolling Realms handy here. So they, Panda has a factory that makes dice. Panda, I don't think owns that factory. It's just they outsource to a company that they really like who makes dice. Panda has a company that makes, or they work with a company that makes uh, dry erase pens. So Panda doesn't need to do all these things in-house, but they have vetted these smaller factories that specialize in them. Um, so Panda in the middle of production definitely has been like, you know, this pen just isn't working. We need to find a better pen. And they found a better, better factory. But uh, the only company that I've ever worked with, well, I won't name a name here, but there's one time where I ended up um, shifting production to a different place and a different company, mostly just because I wanted to try it um, to see if I, if I should work with more than one um, manufacturer. And the experience just wasn't nearly as good. The end product was fine, but they weren't good at sending sample copies. They were terrible at communicating. Um, and they, they changed, it was for a game called Euphoria and they changed, this is kind of a very minute thing, but you might find this interesting. They changed the, uh, the shape of the card corners. So every corner of a card, you know, has a very different slope to it. And, uh, they changed it without asking me. And it meant that their version of the game or their cards in their version of the game weren't compatible with the other version of the game. So if we ever wanted to make expansions for this game, one version was going to have slightly different corners than the other one. And that stands out when you're shuffling a bunch of cards together. So I learned at that point that it was probably best for me to just to work with one manufacturer. And I've loved working with Panda ever since then. That's really good to know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I could definitely see how that would be a problem if they shifted without telling you, certainly. Um, that's yeah. definitely a huge issue, especially from a yeah. player standpoint. I mean, I always look at the the, the cards that, you know, they're slightly different color wise. And so you always know what cards those are, no matter how often you play the game. And so it, it definitely takes away from the immersion experience. Um, and color matching is tough. Uh, and that's tough. Even like we work with Panda, uh, only Panda, and 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 they are the only ones printing our cards. And yet when we make an expansion or a reprint every now and then, like something about the ink can change this the slightest amount. It's not something, it's not a change they've made. It's just materials. Like if you, if we tried to make these same dice, uh, every version of these dice are going to be very, very slightly minutely different. Um, Color matching, color matching is really tough, but, uh, it, and, and you're right. Sometimes it ruins that immersion. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's like, you know, you only can see the top part of the deck, so it doesn't really matter, but sometimes it does. Yeah. Um, so kind of a, a, also an unrelated note to that is um, like, so when you're talking about the process of deciding if you're going to produce a game, how do you decide if a game is cost effective to produce? Like, do you have a set of retail prices in mind that you're looking at? And do you ever consider like, a designer approach you to the game that's going to be way outside that price range, would you consider producing it? Yeah, uh, that's definitely happened. And I really, I, I like this question a lot because it's a good chance for, for us to talk for a second about the difference, uh, pros and cons a little bit between someone just being a designer and designing a game um, and someone being a designer and also a publisher at the same time wrapped in, up into, in, into one big role. That's the, the route that I've taken for Stillmeyer Games because I enjoy designing games, but I also enjoy the business, the marketing, the communications, all that other stuff that goes along with it. But there are plenty of people in the industry that just want to design games and they want to hand it off to someone else to, to create, to produce, to put the, their money and their risk into that game. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you're kind of thinking about those two things. Do you, do you, where where are am. you thinking right now bet between just being a designer and also being a designer and publisher? I'm leaning towards being a designer and publisher just because okay. I'm also interested in and making sure the product looks the way I want it to look. Um, you know, yeah. I, I put a lot of effort into creating design and then if I, the pop end product looks not something I'm proud of, then I, I really don't want it to necessarily be out there. So I'm kind of leaning towards that. I know there's a lot more, probably more chaos and a little bit more, yeah. uh, more headaches involved with that part of it because <laughs> once you can just hand it off it's a little bit easier um yeah. although although i, I know I, I was watching what some of your other videos kind of preparing for this and saw as you talked about actually working with the designers which is really cool uh not all mm -hmm. publishers necessarily do that but um so yeah i'm definitely leaning towards the more of the production slash designer um role 
yeah, I, I, if, if it's something that you're excited about, um, I, th I think that's great. There's a lot of project management that goes along with it, but you being in control of that project management means that you have more control over the quality of, of the end product. Um, and you also, and part, of, part of the reason I'm asking this is, is back to your question, and part of the fun part of it, of, of doing both, of being a designer and a publisher, is that you can look at things throughout the entire design process and development process um, in terms of uh, the the how much the, the product will end up costing and the result in the price. So the manufacturing cost in the game industry, usually the, the, the MSRP ends up being around five times the manufacturing cost. So if a game costs $10 to make, um, usually the MSRP will be around 10, uh, around uh, $50 or $60, somewhere around there. Gotcha. Um, so it's fun to have that to like, whenever I'm working on a game, I'll get a very early quote from Panda, a very early estimate to see what I'm looking at, what I'm working towards. And sometimes even I might realize, oh, this component is adding $3 to the cost. And so that's going to be, you know, $15 on the back end. Is that component really worth it? And so very early on, I might let that impact my design decisions to make sure I'm designing a product that can be, uh, that offers the, the right value for the end customer. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 definitely thinking of games that cost upwards of 150 200 dollars i'm mm -hmm. not going to name names but um uh -huh. there's definitely like a consideration like how much do those actually cost to produce there's so many components to them and i can imagine the detail that goes into proofing all of those different little individual components to make sure they reach their quality standard and uh, figuring out that the cost for something like that seems would be intimidating especially for a young designer so uh yeah and you're kind um, of also in the in the crowdfunding world right now. We're going to talk about I think crowdfunding in a second, but yeah. you're um, you're balancing when you're choosing that price. You're balancing the future retail viability of the game. So if you do have that two hundred dollar game, is that really viable in retail? Does it make sense? Um, versus the the crowdfunding viability and the crowdfunding price because they might be very different. If you have a game that costs say a pretty expensive game might cost like $25 to make. That, that would be a really expensive game to make if that's the manufacturing cost. Uh, for that to be a retail game, that means you probably need to sell it for around $125, maybe even $150 in retail um, because the retailer gets a discount, the, the distributor gets a discount, all those different levels. But if you're selling that same game on Kickstarter, then you take away all those layers. It's just you and the end consumer. So that $25, suddenly for you to be profitable, you don't need to sell it for $125, $150. You could sell it probably for $80 um, on, directly to the consumer. So you're trying to balance those thing, th those two factors is an is a interesting puzzle, sometimes tough to, to figure out, but it, it's always interesting to, to figure out what price is right for the direct consumer versus the distributor and the retailer. Definitely, definitely. Um, so uh, talking shifting gears to something that's a little bit less physical, but um, I know you've definitely done some digital versions of your game. And I'm just kind of curious about your experience of working with app developers, um, you know, developing either companion apps or digital apps and kind of how you control the cost for that. Cause that the cost is going to be slightly different. Obviously it's more about time into the process as well as not necessarily proofing a product and getting it distributed and shipped and all that fun of stuff. Yeah. Digital, digital is a whole, uh, a whole other realm, but it is, as you mentioned here, that it is uh, complementary to many tabletop games. There are tabletop games that depend on digital apps. There's some of those. There are also games that are, um, that are augmented or improved by digital apps. Uh, an example of that, and really my only direct experience with it, because we do have a lot of digital games, but most of them are licensed out to other companies. So I, I kind of said, okay, uh, uh, Monster Couch is a company. They got the rights to Wingspan, the digital version of Wingspan. So they just run with it. They handle it. They send it to us for, for checking for errors and things like that and bugs, but, uh, but th they run with it. They handle it. They invest in it and they invest pretty heavily in it. Um, the only app, I mean, th there have been a few like very small investments that we've made um, to help developers get off the ground, but the only uh, direct investment we've made in an app was a very recent scoring app or scoring calculator for our games. So we're hoping to put a, a scoring calculator for, for all of our games that require some sort of calculation in one app that can also save your scores, just kind of a Stomeyer scoring app. It's, it's called Stomeyer Scores. Right now it only has Wingspan in it, um, but we are adding other games to it. And uh, that's been an interesting adventure to, to try that directly. That sounds like a great concept. I'm, I'm wondering if that'll catch on with more games. I'm sure, I know there's a lot of games that have really complex scoring systems for uh, uh, how, all the, how all the points works. And not yeah. all of them do it very well of, of helping people keep track of things. So definitely yeah. that something like that could definitely make a huge difference for some of the game designs I've seen. 
Um, so yeah, I was kind of yeah. curious how, how, how that worked. That's cool. Um, and you mentioned the, the Kickstarter. That's one of the questions I was kind of curious about is what, yeah. what your experiences with Kickstarter have been, why you moved away from it. And as a new game designer, like, would, would you say that they should stay away from crowdsourcing or do you maybe have some advice for somebody who's like a newbie to the game design field and maybe looking to do crowdsourcing? I absolutely recommend crowdfunding for your first project, maybe even your first several projects. Um, and after then, there are a lot of other variables that go into play. But but for your first one, yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful way to to gauge demand, see if the interest is there in the product that you're trying to create, to um, to help the marketing, give it a boost, to let people know that, that it exists. Um, although not solely rely on the crowdfunding platform to do that for you. A lot of it is, is you doing that. Um, to, to raise funding for the project, that can be one way uh to to make sure that you that you have the funds to invest in the game in the first place enough to to produce the game um and just to, to raise awareness in general and to make the product better through people who show up to the campaign and, and seeing like okay we can we only have a thousand people we can make a baseline version of the product versus oh wow this went better than i thought we have three thousand people signed up five thousand people we can make this game or whatever the product is really really awesome so i highly recommend it for a new creator I moved away from it. Um, I moved away from it after eight campaigns in uh, my last campaign was in 2015, partially because I wanted to improve relationships with retailers and distributors. Um, so they've kind of come around to crowdfunding, but back in 2015, they really didn't like it. Uh, they just wanted the game sold through, through their, their, their stores. Um, and uh, it, it also kind of just felt like the, the right time to, to, instead of, Kind of asking people's permission to make something um to give ourselves permission to make something awesome and just make it and then sell it to retailers and distributors and directly to people as well if they want to buy directly from us that makes complete sense yeah definitely cool. i can definitely see how it'd be helpful to a new a new person who's you know maybe a little bit more nervous about the having the funding to produce something um i mean all the shipping yeah. costs can probably be a bearer especially if you're doing crowdsourcing um because you're projecting out uh, at least a year or some some of the ones i backed have been two three years out i yeah. don't know how you would predict shipping for that far in advance but um it's the shipping is a very tough puzzle you're right it's, it's tough it's tough to pre predict what the cost will be in the future um the, the timing of the future you can do your best um but that's i think one of the advantages that 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 we have now that because we don't use crowdfunding all those variables don't even really matter all that much because we don't even start, we, we don't sell the game until we have it in our fulfillment centers. And so up until that point, everything is uncertain. Even like as we get very close to a game getting to a fulfillment center, there can be the, the trains, like there was almost a, a train strike, a railroad, railroad strike a few weeks ago. If that had hit, that would have changed everything. Um, you know, there could be things at the, at the ports that can change everything. So I, I like taking those variables out of the equation, but for a new creator, I, I highly recommend it. Gotcha. Uh, so, so kind of moving on to my, my last question, but it's kind of similar to the, you touched a little bit on the, in the crowdfunding is more like, so what, as a, how do you, what do you find most effective in connecting with like players, potential fans on like a tight and limited budget, you know, uh, yeah. at what point uh, over the course of your company's growth, did you kind of hit maybe like a critical mass, so to speak, where you're, it became easier to connect because you have a certain number of fans who already bought into your, your product and your brand and vision. Yeah, that's a great question. I, how, how do you how do you build that crowd that that I think you need um, to launch a successful crowdfunding campaign? Um, I think one of the best ways to do it, and I'll, I'll give kind of two answers here. There's a lot of little things that you can do, but I think one of, one of the best ways is to simply be active in the online gaming community um, or whatever the community is. If someone's watching this video and they're not in the games, but they're trying to put a product on, on a crowdfunding platform, whatever the online community is or online communities, be active in those communities, show your genuine interest in whatever people are talking about. Um, and every now and then talk about your thing there and make sure that when you talk about your thing, that people have a way to sign up for it, um, to follow along, whether it's an e-newsletter, whether it's a blog, whether it's the, if you're far enough along, whether it's the, um, the pre-launch page on Kickstarter or GameFound, whatever you're choosing. Uh, I think I think just being present and being a part of those conversations is really free. So this doesn't cost any money at all to do this. It just takes your time to be genuine and active and uh, and uh, offer value to people in, in part of those conversations and get people excited about the thing that you're talking about. So whatever it is, get people excited, show, show, show some cool images of it, let them know what you're working on. 
The other part of it, once you are actually, once you have the product and you're getting very close to launch, I think that's where um, previewers and reviewers uh, are, are a great um, source of, of marketing in the game industry. Sending prototypes, nice prototypes of your game to, uh, to a few reviewers can, can have a pretty big impact. Um, that does cost some money because you have to make a nice prototype. Sometimes the, the previewers do charge some money, but I think um, if you choose the right ones, you're getting an excellent reach there for, uh, for not all that much money. Do, do you uh, kind of, I guess, related to the not really was on my list, but uh, how would like gaming conventions like fit into that, that kind of uh, that preview of, of getting the prototypes? I know that I know I went to Gen Con, there's a number of prototypes that were available for testing. We, I played through a couple of them were really great, great experience mm -hmm. to work with the game designers. How does that kind of fit in? I think that that can be part of a marketing strategy. Um, it isn't one that we've used a bunch because it, at a at a convention, people's attention is drawn in a lot of many in a lot of different directions. And while I think it's great that people are willing to check out some prototypes at conventions, I especially big events like Gen Con, I think their attention is often drawn a little bit more towards the flashy published game that they can buy that day. Um, okay. However, I heard I have heard success from some creators who have really great personalities, have a really great prototype that, you know, they're really great at bringing people in. Um, that's not my personality, but I think some people have that big personality where they're, they're really able to do that. And again, there, I think the key is if you are able to do that and you get people to actually play the prototype and get excited about it, that you have some way to capture their, their email address or something to that point in time, because otherwise they're going to walk away and never know when you actually launch. So I think having that hub where people can follow you or follow along or sign up for the notification is is key no matter how you end up reaching out to people. Gotcha. Okay, so I, I think that was all the prepared questions I had, but did you have any like final concluding remarks of advice to somebody who's just starting a game design company and that they're jumping into the unknown and trying to figure out what to, where to start things? Well, I'm kind of curious about where you are right now with this, Michael. Um, like what, what, uh, what what is what is your barrier to entry right now like what's kind of stopping you from starting or have you already started uh well <laughs> that's a little bit of a, a long story but okay. uh so I, I had some game design games and designs in the works and um a couple years ago i guess it's almost been over two years ago now uh in august house was struck by a lightning burnt down wow. lost everything um oh, wow. so all my designs were completely poof <laughs> To say the least, uh, it was a it's been a challenging couple of years. Uh, it happened yeah. right after COVID, so that also made things even more interesting. Um, so that's kind of been one of the big barriers for me, just kind of getting going again. Uh, now that I've got got the house replaced and all that, so now I'm kind of looking to to re revisit those designs I initially had, try to figure out okay, where was I? What was my additional ideas for that? I'm, I'm working on designs now, but it's it's a process now. So that's been my biggest barrier, and it's been a pretty big one, but. <laughs> I won't lie. Uh, Lightning strike is a huge barrier. Yeah, wow. I, I'm glad you're okay, and hopefully, um, your 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 family and anyone in the house was okay. But that we we, uh, we were not so, home at the time, fortunately. You so okay, we were out visiting her, uh, my wife's parents. So it, fortunately, nobody was home. Nobody got hurt. That's the big thing. But definitely was a, a big life changer. So, so if you could go back, I know it's tough to revisit a tragedy, tragedy. But if you could go back in time. To, to the Michael who had these game designs that you were working on, that you were excited about, um, knowing that something bad was in the future that was gonna happen, would you change anything there? Would you, um, I don't know, I'm trying to find a way to, to, to see if anyone can gain value from, from that very specific incident. Would you have saved the files online? Was there anything that you would have? I that would have. That's yeah. one thing that I definitely learned from that experience is to have everything. Yeah. I, had, I had things backed up multiple yeah. places on portable hard drives and stuff, but I didn't have them saved in the cloud at all. And that's something you think you need to do, um, especially nowadays, because you don't know what can happen. And having it saved in a place that's not dependent on a physical location is super important. Um, yeah, you just, I just can't emphasize that enough because uh, you just don't know what's going to happen. So if I'd had all those things saved in the clouds, I would have at least been able to pick up from where it was and wouldn't have lost all that progress I had made. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, definitely. Definitely. That would be sound advice to anybody who, who's working with any kind of files. Having some kind of a digital online file save of things would be huge. Yeah, I think that's great advice.
and it, it inevitably you're going to lose something that that can't be digital i have i'm looking around at my desk right now i have all these notes about games and things like that but i also have a lot of those notes online in some form and so i it would be devastating i can only imagine how how terrible it was for you but uh but having that online backup i think that's that's excellent advice yeah definitely yeah so that's definitely a big barrier now so now you're getting back into it you're you're trying to remember what was great about those designs and, and what you want to continue. Is there a certain design that you're really excited about? That you're... I, I'm working right now. I'm working on a, it's a kind of a campaign model that should be compatible with 5e D&D. &D. It's um, kind of the, the basic premise is kind of like this time warp. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I'm working through creating the classes, creating the world structure, uh, all the mechanics that are kind of, kind of, they're going to work with okay. the base, you know, base core, um, rules for D&D, but they'll be completely my own uh, origin. So I'm, I'm really excited about that one. I'm also looking into designing kind of a farm sim video game that I've, I've started working on. Uh, kind of playing with that same concept. I'm really uh, fascinated by the idea of uh, like the time shift and how how the past events kind of shape your current and future events. So that's kind of what that game is going to be playing around with, but set in kind of a like in, in a farm sim kind of games, because those are games I really enjoy. They're, they're really kind of relaxing, but they also kind yeah. of, the narrative kind of captures you and, and pulls you in, which is kind of what I like. One of the things I really look forward to. And I have some ideas that I haven't only barely started for a game set in uh, the settlement of uh, like the, the Hop at the Shire, the Middle Earth kind of setting. So uh -huh. that, that, that should be a fun one when I get started. I had more notes on that that were lost and haven't been able to bring myself to go back to start it yet, but... Uh, once I do that, that'll be a fun one to kind of work on. So, so are you, um, are you, do you have a programming and, and, uh, digital development skills or you, I do, you, you do, okay. I do, I have, I, I'm not a graphic artist, unfortunately as much, but I, I do, I know a lot about coding. I've, I've worked in web design. Um, I've got skills with, uh, unity, unreal engine, those, all those, uh, engines. So. I have a fair bit of technical skill, but definitely would have to be getting somebody involved with like the graphic design of some of it. I have some some models that I've created, but definitely not a professional one with somebody to actually do the aesthetics for it. Uh, so yeah. that's something that I'm more fits with my vision. So true. And that's that's I, I've always found that a fun part of the process. I'm not an artist myself, but uh, I, I love reaching out to artists and illustrators or finding trying to find the right one um, for a project. And also, I, I wanted to mention, Michael, one of the key things for, for me with Stillmeyer Games was finding the right partner. Um, for me, it ended up being my friend, Alan Stone. When I was playtesting Viticulture very early on. I didn't realize I wanted it, but after I, I was playtesting with different friends, and after one of those playtests, Alan reached back to me, uh, reached out to me and said, you know, I really enjoyed that. I really had fun with that. Could I help you out with this game on an ongoing basis? And I don't think the company would exist without him because just having someone else to bounce ideas off of to sometimes handle tasks that I'm not very good at or that I'm not excited about. Um, and so it sounds like you, like anyone, I, I have some strengths and weaknesses. You probably have some strengths and weaknesses. Have you thought about finding a a, a partner in that way? It's definitely with? been on my mind. I mean, once yeah. certainly once I finish my master's in December here, I'm definitely, it's something they'll be considering. I know I have a few friends who are kind of in that way, so I might mm -hmm. be able to hit them up with to see if they're it would be interested, but... It's definitely been on my mind because I definitely need somebody who can who who can share that part of the vision and then who has has strong strengths where I don't really have. I mean, I, I have a background in narrative and coding. Mm -hmm. I can do some of those things, but the graphic design is not really where my strength is. So I need somebody who kind of fits that part of the the uh, vision. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I hope that I hope that that search goes well. If you decide it's right for you, I think some people really do work solo and they're fine with that, and they can outsource little tasks here and there. And I do a lot of that, but. Um, but it was nice to have uh, someone constant that I could always rely on and kind of rely on to get excited about stuff with me. That was really nice. That is super cool. Definitely. That, that's yeah. kind of where the origin of the company name came from, right? Like, so it's a combination right. of your, your two names. Yeah. Yeah. Alan's still here in St. Louis. Yeah, we're, we're both here in St. Louis. Although I, I do know some designers who don't live in the same place or some uh, publishers who they just found a partner halfway across the world who like talking about it. And that's one of the things that can come from being active in online gaming communities just talking about games and on, you know, on Facebook, on board game geek, places like that. Cause eventually you might find this other random person in Denmark. Actually, we have a person in Denmark who really? is excited about the same thing that you're, you're working on. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So, so a lot of the, the, the work, the game designs you were uh, worked with are, they're kind of spread out throughout the, the country. How, how is the logistics in that work for you guys? A lot of it's over email. Um, I, there are some, 
definitely some artists and, and multiple designers that I've worked with that I've never actually met in person. I'm trying to think if that is completely true. But yeah, actually, there, there are definitely a few designers that I've, that I've never met with in person or have had very brief meetings with. We just correspond a lot over email. We have usually some sort of, uh, we use uh, Basecamp for, for project management. Um, and we, we kind of just keep track of things uh, remotely. And it tends to tends to work really well. Every now and then we have face-to-face -face meetings, but um, at my company, we don't have many meetings. A lot, Much of our communication, 99% of communication is over, over email. I think that's the norm for some companies now, especially with COVID, is they've kind of yeah. shifted more towards virtual meetings. I know Linda with yeah. where I work right now, most of the meetings are virtual. They have very few in-person meetings right now just because it just it's just the climate where we're in right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and also people since people are spread out, it kind of expands the number of people that you can work with and the number of different talents you can work with around the world if uh if, if you if you kind of don't have that that uh location specific limitation. That's true. That's very true. Yeah, definitely. It definitely opens up the amount of people you can work with, the talent pool, and, and yeah. who you can connect with, certainly. Yeah. Well, Michael, I, I love these questions today. These are great questions to think about. Um, is there anything else that you want people to know before before we sign off here? Uh, no, I don't think I don't think I just wanted to thank you again for, for meeting me. This was been oh. has been great. It definitely was very insightful to a lot of things I've been wondering about for starting my own company. So definitely appreciate all, all the insight you've been able to give me. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And anyone who's watching this on YouTube, if you have any questions um, for, for, I'll let Michael know when the video is live. So if you have any questions for Michael, if you have any questions for me about this game publishing process, some of the decisions that we've made over the years, and anything that you're going through right now, um, a viewer watching this, if you're thinking about doing any of these things and you're finding a barrier or you're, you're, you're uh, looking for, for a path forward, let me know in the comments below. We'll talk about it there. Yep. Yeah, thank you.